Welcome back to Sim Geeks Podcast. We are your hosts, William Belk and David Shablock. We are joined here today with Heather Nolan and Jack Jager, or JJ, of the SS8 Accreditation Council. And so, Heather, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us your background and give us a little bit of information on the council. Sure. My name is Heather Nolan, and I am from Lynchburg, Virginia. I serve a small rural a community hospital there called Centra Health. I got involved in accreditation over 10 years ago and kind of just fell into it and have become a site reviewer, which are the people that go on site to look at the program itself after it submits its application and kind of just spiraled from there. And now I've been on the council now for several years and it's very rewarding for sure. How are you, JJ? Yeah, so I'm from a program in Western Indiana called the Rural Health Innovation Collaborative, or the RIC. I'm the executive director of that program, and we are a standalone consortium. We have nine partners, and we do work for the Indiana State Department of Health. We go to small rural hospitals around the state. I'm also a member of the Accreditation Council. I'm the chair of the Accreditation Council, actually, and I've been involved with accreditation since about 2016, when my program was just finishing up their accreditation process and got in and slowly have been working my way up to where I'm at right now and don't see no end in sight with that. So, you know, one of the things we do here on the SimGeeks podcast is our, our concept is to take something that might be rather intimidating, scary, et cetera, and provide people with the, I don't want to say the easy route, but the basics of understanding how do I get to where I want to go. With that in mind, give us a little bit of background on accreditation, why it's important, and where do we start if we want to head towards that process? What are the entry-level steps of even assessing our own facility and deciding if this is right for us? Well, I mean, accreditation, as soon as you say the word, it, it brings hairs back on the back of people's heads. Yep. And so... Cold sweats, all that. Right. And we want people to understand that SSH accreditation is a little different than the accreditation that they may be used to, joint commission or what have you, if you're in a hospital. And so it's a kinder, gentler approach, I would say. We're not taking white gloves and going on every single surface to make sure that there's dust or anything like that. So we're we're very much wanting to help each program that we go to try to learn to be a better simulation center. And I think that's a key component of this. Yeah, and I think the best part of it is if you go into it to receive accreditation, it makes it laborious. But if you go into it to share what you've done in your SIM program with others and you look back over your shoulder, you realize we've accomplished a whole lot and we have a story to tell and we want to tell others our story and share what we have done. Simulation is probably one of the most collaborative environments I've ever worked in. I was an athletic trainer by trade, and there were very clear lines between the allied health professions when I was in it. And so when I stepped into the world of simulation, I knew nothing. I never had experienced simulation, and the community really wrapped their arms around me and helped me grow. And so now it's like all a part of giving back to the community. Oh, those are great answers. So, you know, you, you kind of mentioned this, that you guys go into this or accreditation process of, of helping people improve. At what point, when I'm evaluating my own program or when I've got somebody who wants, at what point is that like, okay, I'm close enough, let's push forward? And at what point do you take a step back and say, you know, maybe we wait another year and we make some changes? Is there like a good tipping point or scale? What's the value you're looking for there? Well, sure. I mean, so there's a lot of resources out for every program to look at to see, are we truly ready? And you can find all that stuff on the SSH accreditation website. There's a companion document that helps you determine okay, am I meeting this criteria, I meaning that criteria? There's checklists and there's mentors that you can reach out to. And so finding out that information is key to determine whether or not you're ready or not. And from what we see, and I can speak about my own program, when we went through in 2015, I thought, man, I, I think we're ready. But then when you start going through all the standards, wow, I just, I don't know now. And so it helps you kind of grow up as a program as you're the self-review that you do helps you grow. And sometimes it's really kind of jumping off the, the final cliff, right? And then saying, well, okay, we'll see what happens here. But most people, when they do that self-assessment, they'll, they'll come to the realization that they're probably ready. Like any project that is monstrous, it's eating the elephant one bite at a time. And so going through the self-study using the tools that we put together in the past, I would say the past two years, we've made a solid effort as a council to make things easier, to put ourselves out there. We've created courses 
to share at IMSH and then also that can be shared uh, through accreditation where you can go through as a cohort to make it more easier to feel like you have a mentor that comes alongside you. So it, back to the eating the elephant, just starting is half the battle because a lot of our battle is in our mind. Right. And just starting is more than just printing it all out, getting scared, putting it on a shelf and running away. Right. I know a lot of people, you know, they're like, I, I'm never going to be ready. Uh, and so, but I'll go look at the blueprint and they don't go back to it. Right. So you've got to have something. And we actually had Phil Wortham on an episode three years ago talking about accreditation. And he was like, yeah, you have to have that champion, that person that can be that spearhead mm -hmm. and that can really kind of push and push along and keep it focused. Yeah, and that you got to set reasonable timelines and you have to, if you get stuck, reach out to accreditation. Our accreditation staff is very, very involved, very helpful. If they get to a point where they feel like they can't help you anymore, they'll reach out to the council and you'll have a mentor that can help you. And that I've done that a lot on the side is mentored other programs that are going through it. So. No, that's fantastic. You know, you mentioned the website and having a lot of resources in there. We'll make sure that we post that website, a link directly to that page within our show notes. But, you know, you mentioned the resources, the companion document in there. I will say that that was a lifesaver for us because it let me go down and make a checklist and say, oh, I don't have that. I either need to create it or find it somewhere else within my organization and pull that over. And as you're going through it, it lets you very quickly assess what do I have? What do I not have? It may not be perfect. I may still go into this and not be completely confident, but at least let me go, oh, you know what? I'm a lot closer to this than I thought I would be. And the, the companion documents, we've really worked hard on those over the last couple of years to try to hone it in and make it more uh, friendly to the, the person who's looking at it. And we've tried to put in examples in there, not prescriptively, but in a way that say, this might be a way that you could meet this standard or this might be a way. And I think that's truly helped people. I've had lots of people come up to me and tell me that. I think what frustrates some people sometimes is that we are not prescriptive. We don't tell you how you should do business. There are these standards that we have to uphold, but how that, what that looks like in your program is totally up to you and your organizational structure. So with that being said, we can give you examples and we can show you, point you to exemplars, but at the end of the day, you want what works best for you. It's like putting on the properly fit shoe that helps you to grow. And then that's a, a big thing is allowing for the growth that's going to come after accreditation. And JJ, you probably could share about some results from that. But if you don't like the shoes I'm wearing, you're, I'm a failure and I shouldn't even be in sim. You know, people can have a lot of emotion about this and it's a lot of just, I, I, I can't start then. And they get locked. So it, it's not that way. Not the case. I agree with you totally. And um, that's why we try to talk about this as much as we can. It's, it's a kinder, gentler approach to accreditation than, than what most people are used to. Now, Heather, you mentioned that there is support available. And so as people are going through this application process, let's say I gather all my documents, I put everything together into one big application, I submit my application. And let's say as you guys are going through it, reviewing it, you're like, hey, this isn't exactly what we wanted. Maybe someone misunderstood the instructions. How gentle is that? Is there an opportunity for you to say, hey, guys, can you please correct these things? Or is that a, hey, reapply in July? How does that work out? Absolutely. So we don't have direct contact with the program that applies. We rely on our accreditation staff to be the mediator, And so we'll ask questions in advance to get a little more clarification. We do either an on-site visit or a virtual visit, depending upon what type of application you have, whether it's provisional versus full accreditation. And so while we're there, there's this mentorship that happens during that time where, let's say, it's a, a policy and procedure that needs a, a little bit of rounding out or a few elements that are missing. We'll refer them back to the companion document, but we all say, hey, we've watched you do business here. We've seen how this works you might want to consider adding this so that it strengthens your program. And so it's really a collaborative effort that is the beauty of it. It's helpful for us, too, because we need to keep an open mind when you go into seeing that program that how they do business is how they do business. And that's a really big point because so, so many people are doing the right things. We just don't articulate and, more importantly, document it well because that is, again, very scary and laborious or it's just not our thing. You might be doing the right things. It's just you've got to articulate it. You've got to be able to document that and document it in such a way because all of our brains are wired a little different. And succinctly, sometimes it's, it's challenging for people. Yeah. yeah. Right. 
policies for us. So, you know, you mentioned like we we're doing a lot of the things that were in the accreditation document. And as we were going through preparing our application, it was like, hey, we do this, but there's nowhere that it's written down that says we have to. And I'll give you like my favorite example of this. We haven't used live medications in a single simulation event in over six years. We took all that out in 2018. We haven't done it since. It was never a policy. We verbally said, we're never going to do this again, get rid of all your drugs, order all these simulated medications. But going through accreditation, I was like, oh, I actually need to write this down somewhere, right? And so I created a policy that says, hey, guys, you know that thing you're already doing? Right. Now it's on paper, right? We, but we all know we're doing it. Yeah. It, <laughs> yeah. That's part of, I mean, that's the accreditation, right? Like that's adding that level of professionalism to something that maybe we're already doing, but showing that like we are dedicated to this. And to me, that's where a lot of those policies come into place. It's not necessarily that you're going to do it wrong if I don't write it down. Right. It's that right. now there is a policy in place that we can hold people accountable to, right? It's accountability, not just for, for my staff or myself. It's accountability for the program as a whole that you guys can look at us and say, hey, if we find out you're not doing these things, you told us you were, right? There's a level of accountability that goes into that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think it helps that program grow because as the program grows because simulation is a booming industry as it grows then at least you have those policies and procedure to fall back on that there are standards and we love it all the time we're like just blame us blame accreditation we have to do this because of accreditation why not you're not alone i work in the our medical industry and so we are we're very heavily regulated both from the faa and from the healthcare side uh, and so we have another voluntary accreditation that our company goes through and it, it's mm -hmm. right it, it causes heart palpitations in my educators when I bring up accreditation now on this because we're talking about a whole nother process. Mm -hmm. And we very much do that all the time. The educators will do it to explain things to the clinicians, the leadership will do it. Like, yeah. it, it's one of those things like, hey, we have to do this whether we like it or not because it's an accreditation requirement. And so now you have that opportunity to say, hey, we have to have this policy because it's required. Yep. And that was one thing that came out of when we did the first accreditation episode with Phil. It was like it gave me the teeth when people wanted to pull funding, when people wanted to change things and do things differently. He was like, but mm -hmm. that threatens our accreditation. He gave us the teeth to back up doing the right things. Yeah. And that was one of those light bulb moments. I'm like, damn, that's really good because the, people like to change things on the fly. But, but, well, but according to our policies and procedures that our accreditation stands on, you, we need to do it this way. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change gears real quick. So we've talked a lot about kind of that initial, how do we get over that hump? How do we get the confidence to do it? And from what I'm hearing, and feel free to correct me, mm -hmm. is regardless, go for it, right? Look over the policies. And if you feel like you're meeting a significant number of those standards or you're willing to change some things, it sounds like it's a very low risk thing to say, look, I'm going to go ahead and push through with this. So I just want, I want to clarify something. It sounds to me that it's not a yes or a no like stamp. It's yes or yes if kind of if you do these things does that sound appropriate i think that's the the right route yes yeah okay perfect so the the next question i have like i said i, I promise you i'd shift gears here i when we're looking at people that have maybe gone through accreditation in the past versus what we're looking at now what's changed what's changed in the last 24 months what changes should we see in simulation accreditation over the next five years because as you said sim is always evolving so i assume the accreditation process has to as well no question. And we're looking at our standards on a routine basis. It's a 360 degree quality improvement process that we utilize. And one thing that we've tried to accomplish over the last year or so is to make sure that it's worth the time and effort that you put into it. What's the return on investment that you receive from accreditation? And so we've been working with our programs. We're actually developing a, a research study now that is almost ready for publication that demonstrates some of the return on investment that we've been looking for. Increases in human resources for our programs, increases in professional development, increases in patient safety and quality initiatives and, and things of that nature. And that should be published pretty soon. We're very excited about that. The other big thing that we are working on right now is try to grow our reach out into the international community. We have about 270 total programs and almost, I'd say about 220 of those are in the United States. So it's very US centric and, and there's a lot of barriers to that. The cost of travel, the, the application itself is, is tedious and it's not in every language across the globe. And so one thing that we've been working on, we have a pilot program called CISA, the Commission on International Simulation and Accreditation, in which we are going to work with societies around the world, simulation societies, and allow them to accredit programs in their region using SSH accreditation standards under our umbrella. So we are working on agreements with some pilots that are going to try that out over the next year. And we're very excited about it. We think it really could have a potential of growing us internationally. 
Now, I'm going to throw back to another SSH initiative. A year or two ago, they announced that they were going to do like a sliding scale for costs related to examination in low co low income countries. Is are we looking at the same thing on the accreditation scale as well? Yes. I mean, there's there's some of that that we're working on and we know that that the cost of accreditation is pretty exorbitant for some people. We we want to help with that. That's that's a that's a problem that we we know is exists and we need to fix. In addition to that, one of the things you asked what's new or different is we take the process that we expect programs to go through, we take on that as ourselves as an accreditation body. So we go through ourselves to make sure we have the same rigor. With that being said, one of the things that is important to us is that when you go through the accreditation process, that you have meaningful feedback from an outside source on your program, whether it's recommendations or considerations that you might have, but you get a robust reporting back that gives you feedback on the things that were observed either in the documentation. And so I think like, even though it is at a high cost, there is value added to any program because you get essentially experts from the outside coming in to say, hey, David, you're doing a great job. Keep doing it. Here's some ideas to move past where you currently are and reach for the stars and share with others. These are your current roadblocks right. and that we would give you advice on this. Absolutely. Correct. It's definitely the badge of honor. It is a standard that is set across the industry. And, you know, and I know personally, I look at that when I'm looking at other facilities and seeing if they've gone through it. It's completely voluntary, but it means that those people have gone above and beyond and they really care about what they're doing. So I, I agree with that. Well, guys, we're all here at, at IMSH this year. I know you guys are busy. Any parting thoughts, anything big that you want to leave all the listeners with specific to accreditation or even in, just whatever your bits of advice are? I would say one thing is that we are growing exponentially. Every year we're adding a huge amount of new programs. That means we need additional volunteers as we go through this and adding additional program reviewers, people that are going to go to the, and review these sites and determine that if they can become accredited or not is, is a huge thing for us. And so we are very open to people coming and talking to us about becoming program reviewers. And we have a process in place to get them ready for that too. And to become a program reviewer, the only thing that one of the main things that you would have to do is to come from an accredited program. So those people that might be listening to this and are already a part of an accredited program and you want to give back to the community, this is a perfect way to do that. I promise you that if you give your time, it's exponential return for you. I mean, it's the reason why I've been doing it all these years. I can't believe it's been this long, like um, uh, almost a decade involved in, in this process. And I enjoy it as much as I did when I first started. And I've learned so much from other programs. It is so much fun to be a program reviewer. I love working with accreditation. It, make, it makes sense. I, I visit two to three new simulation centers at least every year. And I've never left a facility and not learned something, right? You always like, oh, they're doing something better than I am, or they're there's something I could change to kind of match what they're doing. And so I could see going out and reviewing, you know, you've got your, your rules that you're following, but also just seeing the rest of the world and seeing how everybody else is doing things and being able to take that back home with you. Guys, I, I can't thank you enough for coming out. You know, we, you know, on behalf of, you know, here we're here for the society. You guys are here as well. IMSH 2024. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Well, we appreciate your time and have a great one. You're doing a wonderful show. We, we're, it's such a pleasure to be with you. Thank you.